Bueno, buenas corillos, estamos aquí de vuelta en Sazón Deportivo, como siempre, con tu receta deportiva favorita. Y me voy a un poquito de sabor a tus deportes. Este es el servidor Luis Melende, como siempre, con mi compañero Gabo. Dímelo, Gabo. Dímelo, Luis. Llegamos otra vez a nuestro estudio de Sazón Deportivo porque tenemos otra mega entrevista. Pero antes de eso, vamos a darle un shout a la casa de Sazón Deportivo. Oye, es Webnético, Webnético Estudios. Tiene, es el hogar de más de 20 podcasts. Oye, todo lo que tú quieras crear de contenido, Webnético tiene todo en las facilidades y los técnicos disponibles para hacer tu contenido de alta calidad. Así que ahí tenemos la información y denle un shout out. Ahora sí, Luis, ¿quién es nuestro invitado especial de hoy? Nuestro invitado especial de hoy es un jugador profesional de baloncesto tanto aquí en Puerto Rico en el BSN como en Australia en la NBA. Además de eso ha representado a Australia en FIBA. Nada más, ah, y tiene experiencia en NBA y no lo podemos dejar afuera. Claro. Nada más y nada menos que Mitch Creek. Yo, Mitch, what up, bro? Oh, what's going on, guys? How are we? We're, we're very good. excited to have you here. We're all good. We're all good. You know, this was like a long way. You know, this we, we, we was overdue. But was yeah, it was overdue. But like, like it was like you were in the middle of the playoff run when we actually asked you. So it was like we we didn't want it to bother you. We were like, let's wait for for the playoffs to end. And then we asked him about it. So I saw he was going to jump in out of sea from a plane. And I was like, yo, Mitch, when are you leaving? He told me Thursday. I'm like, oh, shit. So, like, Mitch, thank you for being here, you know, taking you for taking on uh, time off to be here, you know. Uh, obviously, you have a lot of going on because you leave tomorrow. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, we're recording this uh today's what uh wednesday what wednesday, wednesday 19th of wednesday july. 19th of july you know it's not gonna go up today it's probably gonna go up uh the next week but yeah mitch is leaving tomorrow so he's really taking uh, off his time off to come here and talk to us and that's really valuable to us uh so mitch let's let's start with the beginning you know like when did you fell in love with basketball when did you discover basketball So I was uh, I was quite young when I started playing basketball. Uh, my first few seasons as a young little boy, you know, I was six, seven, eight years old when I first started dribbling a basketball. But the the very first few seasons, I actually was scared of the basketball. So the funny thing was, my mum, I had pockets in my shorts, and my mum actually used to watch me run around the court with my hands in my pockets. Um, I was too scared of the basketball. So for the first pretty much two years of my basketball career, I didn't touch the ball. And mum really? was, was like, look, we're not going to keep paying for registration and fees if you're just going to run away from the ball. Like We can do other sports. Um, but after that, she sewed, you know, with sewing needles, she sewed oh. my pockets up. And uh, and actually, that's how I started to kind of fall in love with the game because okay. started dribbling, started passing, had some fun. My friends played. And where I grew up in a little town called Horsham in country Victoria in Australia, uh, it's a very small community, you know, 15, 20,000 people. You know, most basketball teams when I was young had eight to 10 people try out. And okay. guess what? Eight to 10 people made the team. So you exactly. Didn't, you, didn't, you didn't know if you're any good at basketball. <laughs> exactly. Um, but you felt good because you always made the team. But that's kind of where it started. And, you know, I, I went through the, the young, you know, phase of playing 17 different sports and okay. trying everything. And, Played some Aussie rules football and, you know, did little athletics and a bunch of different sports as well. But basketball was the one that my dad played kind of locally and was he had some cool like old school photos okay. um, that were black and white shooting fadeaways in his short shorts and his singlet. So that's where I really fell in love with it and was like, one day I want to get cool photos like that playing okay. basketball. Um, fast forward, you know, 20 something years and... You know, you've got some pretty cool images, some great memories, and you know, you look back, and that's where it all started for me. And a I, lot of highlight reels. But, but I've never, <laughs> I've never heard that before. Somebody to fall in love with the game without actually touching the basketball at first. I can try to imagine you running with your hands inside your pockets, like really. That that. And I wasn't have... really running up and down, from what I what I remember or what you know anyone tells me. But I was more kind of walking and and just avoiding other kids, other kids. <laughs> <laughs> like i didn't really enjoy okay you know the game i was more scared of it uh, but once i actually started to you know catch and dribble and start to and play shoot. the game yeah you, you're like oh you get one in everyone cheers for you mum and dad are going crazy your sister's you know older than me so okay. she wasn't paying any attention but um <laughs> you know she was very academic i was very sporty and outdoorsy um i still think i'm just undiagnosed with adhd <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, self-diagnosed right now but uh <laughs> we're yet to get to go and find if i'm on the spectrum but i think i just couldn't sit still i couldn't stay inside okay. i couldn't focus on one thing at a time 
so that was really hard for me in school. I just wanted to be outside. Uh, I grew up, you know, in the farm kind of community country. My okay. mum's side of the family was all on the farm. Um, they had a lot of land. They had motorbikes and go karts. And you were always busy, to say the least. Always, you were always just busy. doing stuff with my okay. hands. You always had dirt on your knees. Like I, I walked in today with a, a, bleeding, a bleeding, a bleeding knee. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, you just you. It's kind of the way I've, I'm kind of made up now and and built. Okay. That's that's always going to be me. And without a little bit of that roughness around the edges at times, um, I just don't think I'd feel myself, and I wouldn't be myself if I wasn't pushing the limits or finding out, you know, new things or learning new feelings or emotions or putting myself in new situations. So it started from when I was very, very young uh, and that went through like school, all my school reports are like, you know, he's a great leader, you know, he's a great leader. He's very, you know, very vocal, but but he just, you know, he's a dickhead. (laughs) (laughs) So Look, my teachers actually gave me a pretty good rap um, when it was a, a hands-on task. Okay. I always excelled with that. But when it came to sitting there reading, revision... <laughs> that was man, not your thing. Just, yeah. <laughs> F wasn't for fun. It was for fail. Yeah. So I thought it was for fun. <laughs> but that's, that's a good philosophy to look at things. Like, okay, that, I thought I was just having fun. I was having fun doing this. And talk to me about your first game because... You had a little rocky start trying to like get involved in the game. Talk to about talk to me about that first experience where you're in a real life basketball game. Yeah, it's it's always Were you scared. It's equally, always hard. Or? I mean, I was I was very young, so I don't recall a lot of the feelings I went through. But I just for me to to be in a new environment, you know, back even six seven years ago, uh, like I'm 31 now. You'd put me around 24, 25. I was having a conversation with. Um, someone yesterday who was asking for some advice on certain areas of life and my agent kind of called me and and pushed me along and said hey like you should have a talk to him but the thing is like I wouldn't ever be able to have those conversations now without putting myself in situations that made me uncomfortable and back then 24 25 I had no idea what I was doing let alone when I was a teenager let alone when I was 18 as a professional playing basketball so as a kid I think the fear of like being around other people, failing, not being accepted, not being liked. I I struggled to fit in at school quite a lot. You know, I had really bad acne. I was really skinny and um, very white. Like I've got a tiny bit of a Puerto Rican tan. I can see the monitor in front of me. Like I actually look like I've got a little bit of a tan. So um, five months on the beach would do that. But back then, like I just had no confidence, no real groups of friends, you know, I had my, my two, three closest friends went to the other school in town where I went to the private oh, one because okay. my sister was older, trying to do the, the study side of it. And she wanted okay. to do and, and, and be very... Yeah, yeah and a, be, uh, yeah. a better academic uh, environment. She, she was definitely in that one. Uh, I definitely didn't get those those genes. But over time, I slowly developed that and added to my arsenal of life and sport with, you know, the curriculum and, and studying and learning things. So... But as a kid, you put into a situation, you know, you feel uncomfortable, you soon grow up and realize, well, this is where life is. This is exactly. life. Like you're never going to be comfortable all the time. And if you are, you're going to lead a, a pretty bland life. Exactly. And it's going to lose its taste really quickly. And you're going to start to become negative, well, emotional, you, reactive. Yeah, we, we've talked about that before. Yeah. Some people think that sports is just for you to develop your physical capabilities, to to be a little bit more healthy. But people underestimate the, the social mental, values yeah. and how that builds up character and how that gives you a lot of tools to face on life and to be successful in life. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I do a lot in the space of mindset training. Uh, I mentor kids. I have kids booklets and stuff that I've built out about mental health, resilience, goal setting, implementation, daily routine, yep. review processing, who to talk to, especially in Australia. You know, we have Lifeline, we have different uh, Beyond Blue, we have different places where you can call anonymously. But all those things you, you speak about, you're right. Like basketball is not just physical. I mean, exactly. you go and play in Carolina in a game six and you say, okay, it's just a physical game. Exactly. You're absolutely <laughs> stupid. <No. laughs> like, they got, you know, True. 10 train horns, they're going crazy. The fans are screaming at you from two inches away. Exactly. You know, and you, you got to they, go. They're and, flipping the finger at you like in your face and you're like, bro. Like, yeah, like, <laughs> hey man, I'm, I like you. You guys yeah. are actually cool. Like, Yeah, you're yeah. like, bro, like you don't even know me. <laughs> Why do you flick the finger at me? But that's the thing though, is we as athletes, you know, and I, I call myself an athlete in this space right now, but I don't identify myself as an athlete. 
I want to be much more than that. I want to have much more of an impact on this world than just, oh, I was a good basketballer or I did it the right way. Those things are great, you know, utensils to have in your kitchen, but I don't want that to be everything in my kitchen. I want everything in there. Exactly. Yeah. You don't want that to define you. Exactly. Not at all. So when you go and play these games, you realize that, okay, well, I've got to go and guard Mike Scott. You know, he's he was my key matchup in the in the finals. Before that, you had a Paris Bass all season long. You've got Hassan Whiteside. You've got all these stud Tough players. Matchups. And you got to go out, do your your review, yeah. do your study, you watch film, you go to the game. You might be sore and tired. You've got an injury. You you know you've got a relationship that's maybe not as stable. You got some stuff at home. You have got family and friends you're not seeing for five months. You're living on the other side of the world. And it's great because, yeah, we're in Puerto Rico, we're on the beach. It's beautiful, like coral beach, you know, sunshine exactly. and sand between your toes. But it's all the other stuff. And then you got to go out and play against these great players. And, and then you miss, yeah, you miss a shot. You, you have a turnover. Everyone looks at you and you're kind of like, yeah, I'm, I'm trying. I'm not trying to kick it off my foot. Like, <laughs> yeah. exactly. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to guard Mike Scott. Like, he's a bloody good player. But that's where you, you, the mental side of it. If you haven't trained that, you're just going to crumble. And we, we've seen so many great players come into the BSN this year. And it's like, wow, we've got a name. Like, it's such a great signing. And then it was like, hey, where yeah. is he? And it's like, we got cut. Exactly. Yeah. Like, that well, is oh, hang on. He got cut. <laughs> like, that's, yep. that's, that's crazy. Cool. Yeah. Friends of mine were like, that guy's there. You're like, yeah. And you're going to last a little week. You're like, what? Yeah. It's, it's, it's baffling. But wow. that's, that's the level of this league. And I think that's where the progression over the probably the last – Five years, the BSN has really taken off, and I think it's got a, an absolute trajectory to be a top league in the world, not just in the Americas. Um, and I think people are going to continue to come here, so it's exciting to be a part of it. But yeah, and the way that you've explained it, you know, the way that you said you want to transcend what's, you know, you don't only want to be an athlete, you want to transcend, you want to be, you know, you want people to know you as Mitch Creek, the, the great guy that helped a lot of people to help young kids, you know, uh, go through tough situations, uh, obviously maybe by sports, maybe by other things, you know, uh, with nature, learning how to love nature like you do, you know, you love the beach, you love, uh, you know, uh, doing skydiving. So yeah, that's, that's, I would say that's really touching, man, because there's a lot of people in this world that, don't like to see the the positives in in other people they only like to see the negatives and like the bad things that are happening and the way that you you've always talked to us and when we interviewed you in the court and now that, that you're talking here with us a little bit more closely you know you show that there's always good in people and there's always a benefit of trying to look for that good in other people so yeah like I really like all that you said right there. Yeah, I, I just touching on what you said, I, I think the the biggest thing you said was stagnation. And what, when you become stagnant in anything, you, you feel stuck. Like you don't feel like you can get up. You don't feel like you can go to the gym and be consistent. Um, I did a, a podcast literally, I think two or three days ago in my house. And um, they were like, oh, uh, one of the girls that was interviewing me uh, had said, oh, like, you know, do you ever do positive affirmations, do you have anything like that? And I was like, I've got two boards in my room. One is a life goals. It's a 12 month to, to, to three yeah. year, you know, foresight for me. And I go, okay, that's what I'm working towards. Exactly. That's why I'm staying in Puerto Rico. I'm playing, you know, the financial decision. You have, you know, the y your fire poker in the fire. You've got different ones everywhere and you're trying to work on things. But then it's like, I have a daily, not an affirmation that I tell myself, but it's just a routine that I try and stick to because if I can do those bare minimum things, and it, it was like, one is like, um, uh, like be kind to yourself, like put yourself first sometimes, yep. go for a walk, get in the beach every day, do cold plunge every day, cold showers only, meditate for five, uh, for 10 minutes, um, cook every meal, you know, little tiny things where I'm like, okay, I've got to be productive today. My production isn't going out and having 20 and 10 and getting a win. Exactly. Production for me is, My job will take care of itself. My job is basketball. But me as a human being, I'm not always going to be here. And exactly. my mind's not always in a great place. So if I put myself first sometimes, it's like, ah, oh, okay, I've given myself time. Now I can give myself, you know, the freedom to say, hey, that person may not be okay. Let's reach out to them. You know, it, it might be a simple gesture of there's a homeless man in, in Condado who works right off the freeway. And every single day I go to the gym, we saw him every single day shaking his pants, super reserved to himself. 
And every single day I used to go past and get a juice from Crushed Juice right around the corner. I'd go up and I'd give it to him. And every day I saw him on repeat. And after about two months, I was like, let's go to Walmart. We went to Walmart. We went and picked out a big backpack full of stuff like books, things to read, learn, you know, clean clothes, socks, jocks, all that kind of stuff. Because he's, you know, yeah, he was just, in just, he's just yeah. in, a, in a bad way. And like, I've never been one to post that kind of stuff on social media because I don't want to be seen as someone that does right. it. But sometimes when you talk about it, you go, that moment for me of giving a guy a smoothie, and I don't know if he liked it, he spoke no English. Exactly. Uh, I used to use Google Translate to try and translate like, hey, like if I get you a smoothie every day, what would you like? And he was just like, care? Like, I had no <laughs> exactly. idea. I was like, God damn, okay, man, I hope you like this. I'm not allergic to orange. Like, um, But those little gestures, and it might just be saying, I went to Panda Express on the way before here. And it might just be saying, here's an extra 20 bucks, pay for the next person's meal. And that $20 might relieve that. And now they can go and maybe do something else with that money. Yeah. So that's my mental approach to every day now is if I can take care of myself, I allow myself to be in a space where I can be okay and I can accept whatever the world gives me, but now I can help other people when I'm not taking away from myself. Because the greatest saying is hurt people, hurt people, healed people, heal people. And I think it's the most truest saying in the world and something that for maybe two months when I was over here, I was going through a bit of a rough patch I had things in my life that was happening and I really struggled. I was like, I want to go home. Like, I, I, I can't finish the season. I spoke to my family and friends and we found a way to get through it. But then as, at the other side, probably a month ago, I got to a really, really good space. And I was like, that trying time, that pressure time, that's where people say, oh, you know, pressure makes diamonds and, you yep. know, you can't go through it, you know, without getting to the, like all these sayings are cliche, but it's like when you're in the moment and you have everything kind of at your fingertips that people go, oh, you should be fine. You're an athlete. You know, you get paid good money to exactly. to deal with 20,000 people yeah. yelling at you and telling you, you know, you should do this and that. But it, it doesn't give anyone the reason to say, oh, cancel culture is okay. Exactly. I can be negative towards you because what, I'm sitting at home and I'm not a professional basketballer exactly. in Puerto That's Rico. True. Like, I wish I could be a normal person sometimes. I wish I could go and get some shots up, but I can't do that. You know, I wish I could go down to the mall, you know, at different places and not have people come up and you know, interrupt a dinner or do certain things, but it's a part yeah. of the territory and you accept it. And you go, you know what? Instead of making this a negative experience, how about I make this positive? You want to take a photo? Yeah, man, let's get a selfie. Let's get one. Hey, let's get another one real quick. Bah, bah, bah. All of a sudden, it's like, this guy's just giving me two or three photos. He's asked yep. me one or two questions as well. Where I'm from, what's my name? Nice to meet you. Now, I'll never remember his name ever again. Exactly. But the thing is, he remembers it. Yeah. That's so true. as much as cancel culture is so prevalent in the world right now, as you touched on, it's not hard to be kind and it's not hard just to shut your mouth and not say anything or not comment anything because unless you're my coach or you're my family, exactly. you know, my partner, whoever it is, like unless you're that person in my life, you know, I'm, uh, I just, I just will never give anyone not the respect, but the time of day to have exactly. that, that, that comment. type of effect on you. Yeah. Exactly. It just, you know, you never let, you know, a bee will never waste time telling a fly it's shit. Exactly. exactly. Like, exactly. Come on, man. I totally like, agree. That's a big pile of shit. Yeah. He's like, no, it's not. This is great. Like, I, I know that you might not feel comfortable hearing these, but you, you're a terrific role model and a terrific human being. But I want to try to understand how we, how this version of Mitch Creek landed, and I want to talk about how you started as your first professional experience. Because right now we're talking to a veteran who's lived and has played in a lot of overseas basketball, a lot of different platforms. But I want to try to understand how this great human being got to be who he is right in front of us. And you started at Adelaide. 18 years old. Adelaide, Adelaide, yeah. Adelaide. Adelaide 36. How was that start and how crucial was this experience for Mitch Creek, the basketball player that's here today, to start to develop himself? So it started with the Adelaide 36s in the National Basketball League in Australia. But even before that is kind of when it started with Junior Australia. We had okay. World Cup. We had a, a tournament yeah, we actually in, in won Germany. A, uh, in Germany, a, a we, yeah, gold we, medal. We won a gold yeah. medal in Germany for the under-18 Worlds. We went to uh, Lithuania for under-19. The following year, I think we had sixth place. Um, but that's kind of where it started. And it was it was a bit of a... I didn't know if I was going to go to college or if I was going to go to be a pro. And I looked at it and I said, well, all the collegiate guys are going to start in maybe six months, like January, okay. like the calendar years when it all starts. And at the moment it was, I think like July or something like that. And I just had finished this tournament. I was having an ankle clean out because I had bone spurs. 
It was the first injury I'd ever really had. And I turned around and went, okay, well, what am I going to do? College or am I going to go pro? That decision was hard. And a lot of kids, especially if you're in a position where like, I'm very lucky to be an Australian. I'm very proud. I'm very honored. I'm still part Puerto Rican now, but (laughs) (laughs) um, I do love the fact that I'm an Australian and we are very lucky. We have clean water. We have healthy, clean food. We have, you know, loving families, a great culture. And that's a great place to be brought up. We have a good education system and it gives us the ability to go places and to do things in the workforce. Now, if you're starting and you're making that decision, I do think college is a great route. I think two years minimum for anyone that's going to do it for college is a great route. If you're going to do four years and commit mentally, good on you. But you're going to get there and you're going to think, oh, this is a great time, frat parties, I'm going to have fun as a bloke and play basketball. But you do that, basketball loses out. And there's a lot of other collegiate athletes that are going to work harder Harder than you, you, put in more time, research more, read more, do more, not drink that drink, not go to that party, not eat that food. So you're going to go there, give yourself two years. At least then you're halfway through a degree. You want to finish somewhere else and you want to transfer or go back later on, great. You want to finish it, awesome. You've got an education. That's important. The other important thing is if you want to go and be a pro straight away, you don't need to go to university to be a businessman or woman. You don't need to go to university to become anything in this world, an entrepreneur, to be an investor, to make money, to do work in sales, to be a podcaster. Like I don't know the last time someone did a five-year degree to be a podcaster. Some people start on their couch with a tin can and a piece of string and they make it work. So it's relative to what you think the world is. And for me, I don't think the schooling system and the collegiate system of learning is really appropriate. I think we get confined to a systematic norm that we think is normal. Let's go and get a four-year degree, get a big debt if we don't get a scholarship, and then we have to work for someone else. Uh, Did you ever get a class and and you know they teach you how to do your taxes? uh, Nope. Nope. Fold clothes. They they cool never food. teach you. They never teach yeah. you anything that is actually meaningful in life, like how, how to manage a budget, how to manage budget, communication no. skills in yeah. a room full of people, yeah. how to leave an impression, how to leave a note or a hey, I've really enjoyed sure. a conversation. I'd love to continue this over a coffee one time. Exactly. I think we could be great together and be able to help each other along the way. Yep. Here's my contact information. If you don't mind me asking for yours, that'd be fantastic. And then straight away you're like, holy shit, like. I just met 10 people tonight. I save all their contacts. It's like, hey, I love this. I always get a photo with people. Like if I get a, a contact photo, I take a photo because nine times out of 10, I do forget. <laughs> um, but that's how that's life. That's how life works. Exactly. Yeah. Like that's every true. entrepreneur won't have gone to Harvard. You know, every lawyer that is making it in their own firm didn't go to Washington or wherever the big fancy yep. schools are. Like I don't exactly. even know Yale. Uh, you know, they're, they're just not necessarily the the way forward so when i first started i thought that was the way i thought the the australian and american dream and whatever you want to call it life taught me that i should have gone to university and got a degree i always kicked myself until i was about 25 or 26 and i didn't get one uh i did my certificate three and four in fitness separately so i was a trainer uh but i was like I, i never went to university but what do i want to do i want to own a house okay i want to own a house pay it off get a wife and kids, get a dog, white picket fence, that shit. And then I realized like, okay, someone goes, that's a dumb idea. I was like, what? It's pretty happy to me. Exactly. And then they go, well, if you own your own house, you're going to have to pay depreciation costs, holdings, you're going to continue to pay it off for 30 years. I said, yeah, but I own my own house. And he goes, well, but do you understand all these other things in life? Now I'm 18 years old playing first time. Exactly. My first check was piss all like it was nothing you could buy tostitos and some salsa dip for what i was making and i went out and i was a, a dickhead and i went and bought a, a five thousand dollar car my first month's paycheck was like five and a half grand and i was like oh, shit. Oh, right, man i was like i don't have a couch i don't have a bed I, got I, don't got a I, I, I paid a bond and i didn't have any money for rent and i was like can i can yeah. i get an advance on my my next paycheck and you're like well i'm gonna sleep in the car and I literally was like, I am so not ready for life. Yeah. Um, so the first like couple of reality years, check. Yeah, the first couple of years are rough. Playing wise, I went from being an MVP at a world championship tournament to literally end of the roster, 
all these guys were bigger, stronger, more athletic, could shoot better, pass better, dribble better. And I was like, well, damn, I suck at basketball. Yeah, they, they that, were grown men. Grown men that had experience. Exactly. I got your stats here. And the first big jump in your stats was at the 2014-2015 season where you jumped to 12 points per game. But the first ones were five points per game and little minutes. Yeah, that's that's the reality of, of professionalism is like thinking you're the shit and then getting hit with a shit stick. <laughs> exactly. And you go, well... I wasn't shit, but I, I definitely know what it feels like to get exactly. hit with it. And you you feel belittled. You feel like you know, you know, achieving. Like I, I, I literally, I think this is the funniest thing in the world. But I told this gentleman yesterday about it, and he was talking about investing and stuff. And I said, "Do you want to know something funny?" I said, "About seven years ago, I had a screenshot of my account, and I said in my account, my sister and I were laughing because." At the time, my sister literally had like negative $100. <laughs> she had like a, a debt and like a loan she had to pay. And she's like, I don't know where I'm going to pay this from. Like I got debt collected. Like she went through a divorce and and I was like sitting there one day and I, I thought I was great. I had, you know, I'd go out and have drinks with the boys and shout around and, you know, you go and do stuff, buy a motorbike. And then I realized I was like, holy shit, like I, I got, got no money. Like I had like yeah. minus 1200 bucks in my account. I had to pay rent and I overdrew it. And then I had a credit card owed like four or five grand. I have a screenshot of it. It's the funniest thing you'll ever see because now I look at where I'm at and I'm like, fuck, that's cool. Like, exactly. <laughs> I made a big jump, but it took me a lot of learning. Like my yep. first five years, like you said, I was terrible. I sucked. I, 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 I didn't buy in. I didn't work the way I should have worked. Like I worked hard, but I wasn't consciously thinking like a Steve Nash routine, 25 oh, minutes, yeah. like perfection. He had a, a, he had detail, he had routine. He had a clear pathway to progress. I didn't have that. I was just, you know, two hour workouts, just killing it in the gym, fit and strong, but I never really progressed. And then I had a coach who said, hey, mate, you could be an Australian, like an Olympian. If you believe in yourself the way I believe in you and see you, like you could play in the NBA, you could do this. And I was like, this guy's crazy. Like he's cuckoo. Uh, and that was the year. I, I, I jumped from four or five points a game, maybe 10 minutes at most to, yep. you know, 12, 13 points a game. Um, you know, I ended up being a captain of the club the following year. Uh, I almost left basketball before that season started because it was so hard. I was going to ask you that. I was going to ask you, like, in those those couple of first seasons, did it ever cross your mind, like, I don't want to do this anymore? Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I don't feel like I'm good enough. Like, they're not giving me a chance yeah. or, you know, they're just so much better than me. I don't want to do this anymore. Definitely, you go through emotions of, I'm not good enough. I'm not getting a chance. Poor me. But really, it was like, you are the, you're the creator of your own demise. Like, I always say, you never shit in the, in the, in the bed you lay in because you're going to roll around in it. And I was doing that. And I was thinking I was the victim. But really, like, I was the person hindering myself from performing and playing at a higher level. And when Joey Wright was the coach at the time, shout out uh, J-Dub. When he, and we're, we're as thick as thieves now, we still call, we still text, we still stay in touch. I love that guy to death. Um, but when you really are in that moment, you go, like, I really need to pull this pull this apart and dissect it. And he helped me do that. We were doing shooting at midnight. It's like we were doing work. I'd be like, hey, man, I need to work out. Like, let's go. And yep, yeah, cool. We get reps up. We do the right thing. And then it was like, oh, now the leadership comes along. You can lead, but you need to, you need to act accordingly. And it's, a, it's been hard to do that. But at the same time, I, I look back and I go, those years of learning helped me become the player I am today. Exactly. But then it was, as you said, you go to a, a short to zero role for the first couple of years. Then you become a little more progressed. And then all of a sudden, it's like, oh, now the fruits start to come. You get a bit more money. Exactly. You get to play overseas. You know, it might be a second or a low division relegation team in Germany in, in Gottingham at the time, but exactly. I performed well. And then it was like I came back. I had another offer for Würzburg. I signed that and then I go to an NBA Exhibit yeah. 10 gig. And all of a sudden you're like, if I had done this when I was uh, 18, yep, 100% would have been here five years earlier. <laughs> you're like, exactly. God damn, why we, did I not know this? We, That's we, the thing people look back and go, I wish I had done this 100%. Like, exactly. Absolutely. We got a picture right here about you in, in a Long Island Nets uniform. Let's see if we can find that. Let me... The blue jersey. I, yeah. think he, I think he was celebrating. Here it is. Boom. Now that you see this picture, what emotions come to your mind seeing that after you already told us all your progression, all your how you had to not only work on yourself physically, but mentally 
but you got to Long Island Nets, and that was like your first shot knocking at the door of the NBA. What does that picture resemble, or what does it mean to you, and how was that experience? I mean, I think that photo at the time is probably me yelling at someone to get back on defense or <laughs> to dive on a loose ball or something. Um, I mean, I do look really jacked and tan for yep. some reason. <laughs> but I think it was just, it was so hot in those gyms and it was so cold outside that I had that that really, and I was very white at the time and I still kind of am, but um, I, I, it was that red glow. So I'll give that, it's not the tan. But these are the moments you look back and you go, I think about the, my NBA journey and the exhibit 10 and not making the first cut and then playing G League and then being in that team, uh, I look back and I go, that was hard. Like that was really, really hard. Like it was tough. I was by myself, you know, in Long Island. I'm not in beautiful Manhattan or exactly. Brooklyn. No, we're in Long Island. Long Island. It's a Long Island. Like, <laughs> shit's long. Not a lot to do in Long Island. Nope. Either. There, there is um, not a lot to do. Yeah, apart from your car battery freezing and it, having to swap it. I don't like, know shit about Long Island. I only know Whoa. that it's in, the, it's in the New York area, but I have no idea yeah, what happens in Long Island. Island. I, I visited, you yeah, know, I'm, I have some family over there and I visited literally. Like Mitch said, there's absolutely <laughs> nothing, nothing to do. To do. Yeah. Okay. Nothing. And look, we stayed in a in a Hilton hotel, like a not a not a no, not a fancy not a luxury hotel. Yeah. yeah, not a nice one. It was like you know brown brown floors and like carpet. It was like the golden grandmother carpet. And but was it a better uh, burgundy, breakfast or bur bur no? Burgundy curtains, like you know the one I'm talking yep. about. Um, you know there was no smart TV, there was no Netflix, there was none of that kind of stuff. Um, you know what, internet was pretty dodgy. But the thing is, you're there, you're in the trenches. People say the grind and, oh, we did this and that. It's bullshit. A grind is something that you don't like doing, but you still do it anyway because you get yeah, paid to. Exactly. It. And that's torture. That's a prison. That's imprisonment. I look at basketball and say it's tough. It's tough physically and it's tough mentally. And that was hard. I played that whole season. And I heard, oh, you've done an amazing job. You're going to get a 10-day. You're going to get this. You're going to get this. And for a while, like a couple of months, it wasn't happening, but I was hearing the right things. And my agent was talking to me. Shout out Mogul Sports and uh, especially on the island, uh, Maldonado, MSM. Um, but yeah, uh, Marquise was was looking after me and, and he was just like, man, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Stay with it. And I'm sitting here going, well, pff, end of the season's like two months away and I haven't got one yet. So what am I like? Am I really going to make it or exactly. not? Because I got a deal in Germany. I can finish a season and the G League at the time, like you get an exhibit 10. Uh, it's common knowledge. It's really easy to look up. It's about 50 grand potentially for training camp. You can get paid zero. You can get paid 50. Um, okay. I got the 50, which was great. But then G League contracts at the time were like $32,000. Yeah. Yep. It's like it's not like it's, today. Yeah. I mean, it's not a lot, but they they look after you some meals and stuff like that. And when you're at Brooklyn, you know, they were I was training there, then getting a car or a train back out to Long Island. I was working out there with the team and then I'd come back and train against some injury guys and it was cool to go back and forth and play against the caliber of players, but it was tough. It was cold. It was miserable. I was in a relationship that was long distance at the time. That was hard and suffered. We ended up splitting. So all these things come into it. You miss your family. I was gone for, you know, 12 months. It was hard. Yeah. But then all of a sudden you get that call and I was like, man, I, I, I think I need to go to Germany. Yep. And then all of a sudden my agent calls me and he's like, hey man, so you got a, a 12 day road in, on the West coast, right? You know, in, in the G League coming up, I was like, yeah, man, tomorrow we leave. And he goes, oh, so uh, unpack your bag. I was like, huh? And he told me, and then I get a call from the coach. And I remember Will Weaver was the head coach and I love Willie to death. And he, he called me and I just bawled, bawled my eyes out. I was in tears, sobbing like a little baby that didn't get yeah. fed on time. I was <laughs> kicking and screaming on my bed. I remember hanging up and Trajan Langdon and um, and the team and all the, the the staff at the Nets gave me a call and they said, hey man, like unpack your bags, you're suiting up tomorrow night for the Brooklyn Nets. And nice. I was just like, That's this awesome. shit is cool. Yeah, Called well, my family, cried my ass off. They were crying and they got on a flight that that morning and, to and, watch flew, you. and flew flew in. They missed the first game, but they got there for the second one on the second night. And I'll, I'll just never forget that. It brings me with so much happiness and joy. I think we got a picture of your photo shoot day. For the Brooklyn Nets. There we go. Hey, there we go. 55, baby. <laughs> Look at that. I was going to ask you, like, every in every single uh, stop you've made around the world, well, at least the one that, that we watched, you always were 55. Like, yep. wh why 55? Does it have a special meaning? So when I was in Adelaide, uh, there was a restriction on numbers. You couldn't go up to a certain number. Uh, and I think the number was about 34. That was, like, the captain of the team. Okay. That was his number. 
and you weren't allowed to go higher than that at the time. But I, I always wanted to. Dad, my my dad wore number five with all his jerseys growing up. Footy, uh, Australian rules football, okay, basketball. Um, so when he he wore number five, I was like, I want to wear number five. First day I walk in, I want number five. And they go, yes, yeah, sweet, no worries. Boop, sign it, all good. Call me an hour later. Hey, man, you can't have number five. We've actually retired the number. We forgot. And I was like, <laughs> oh, shit. So then I was like, okay, well, can I get 55? Five for dad and five for me. Okay. And they said, nah, man, we, you can't go above 34. So I was like, all right, well, I said, I'm not Michael Jordan, but two and three is five. So that'll do, 23. Exactly. <laughs> so I had 23 for, I think, the first three years. And then after that, uh, they opened it up and said, you can have whatever you want. And I went five. Five, five. So five for my dad and five for me. And nice. I've had it pretty much every single jersey uh, since probably about 23 years old. So it's been awesome. Yeah, yeah. because we, we, we got a lot of pictures of your trajectory and all of them are 55. Yeah. And I was like, Even your yeah. IG user, and let's put it right here. What is it? Mitchell Creek 55. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Just Literally, in case. I, I asked Gao, oh, I was like, we have to ask him about the number. Yeah. <laughs> like, there has to be a story, you know, behind, behind it. it. But yeah, definitely, I understand. Like, hello, like, you play basketball because of your dad. So, like, wanting to wear his number or maybe wear your own number, but give it a twist that yeah. you know represents him. And it's awesome. It's, nah, it's really funny. awesome. Yeah. About and, your NBA experience as a full, like, we're looking back at it. What was that NBA experience for you, and did you feel like you were ready for it? Uh, as I touched on, the G League was a hard experience. Um, for me, family is a massive thing and friends are a huge part of my life. So not having those two things was very tough. But once you get the call, you're like, oh, this is awesome. I'm here. Like, let's do it. And I remember my, my first night, I wasn't meant to play. They're like, hey, just sit on the bench. Like, just relax. You're going to just watch. Like, you know, exactly. you suit up, just get the feel of it. You know, tomorrow night, well, after the game tonight, we fly. It was a Monday. It's like we fly to Boston and we're actually playing in Boston at TD Garden. And I was like, Woo! he's like, you'll play tomorrow night. And I was like, yeah, sick. <laughs> so I'm sitting on the bench and I don't know if you've been to an NBA game before, but that shit goes forever. Yep. And I'm sitting there. It's like, I think third quarter. I'm stone cold Steve Austin, frozen. And I've got my tracksuit on. And then all of a sudden, Kenny Atkinson, the head coach goes, you're in. That? Like, he's like, what? He goes, Mitch, you're in. I was like, nah, not me too. Like, we didn't sign another Mitch. Which Mitch? Which Mitch? Yeah. And then I swear to God, they the opposing team. So Ronde Hollis Jefferson, shout out Ronde. Uh, we obviously were playing together in Brooklyn at the time, but he went in for a layup and he hurt his shoulder, landed on the ground, and he went out back. And then what happens is when someone from that your team gets injured on a on a foul shot, the opposing team coach picks who shoots the free throws. And he picked me. <laughs> he was like, you know what? This guy's going to shit his pants. And he was right. I absolutely <laughs> shit my pants. Um, the cool thing was Ed Davis was actually the guy that I substituted out of the game. So he was okay. playing for Brooklyn as well. Um, and it's come full circle now coming through Puerto Rico. But uh, I, I went out there and I, I remember it as I, I gave him a high five, I put my mouth guard in thinking like, yeah, I'm going to go and play for minutes. I was just going to go shoot foul shots and get subbed off. <laughs> But I rolled in and he, he high-fived me and he said something. And all I remember my brain computed was like, don't like don't fuck it up. Like, <laughs> this could be your only chance you ever play in the NBA and you get two free shots. <laughs> I sat there. I didn't shoot a jump shot for four hours. Like I literally did my warm-up pregame, which is like three hours, four hours prior. Exactly. And I hadn't shot a ball since. Like I was literally, I remember being at the line. I took my dribbles and I just think, okay, I got the same routine, two breasts, right hip, exactly. one dribble. Bang. Uh, it didn't bang. It banged off the back of the wing. <laughs> and I just think, oh, don't be that guy. The whole crowd's starting to be like, ooh. <laughs> and I just think, oh, don't be that dickhead. This is going to be a meme. Like, I just know it. This is when memes and vines are in. And I was like, I'm going to be that guy for Brooklyn. Um, uh, I didn't fudge the second one. I made it. Um, I ran back, like, on defense, like I was going to play a possession. And they're like, get off <laughs> <laughs> sit, sit, down. sit down i was part i got high fives and i was so happy and i sat there like you know you know like a pig in shit i was i was pumped it was it was the best thing ever uh next night played um did pretty well you know i played 20 something minutes i had some good stats um felt like i helped the team but then you know played against Giannis under the played against him for 20 minutes guarded him for quite a lot of my time on the court you know just Damn, that's un a handful unreal experience 
you know, got to play in Dwayne Wade and Dirk Nowitzki's last ever NBA game. Like that is just yeah, the that's pretty cool. Yeah. I'm a huge D Wade fan, oh, and I man. forgot that detail. That's right, you were right there. I was right there. I dapped him up, said congrats, said, thank you so much for what you did for the game, and he, he wished me all the best. And, Damn, and... I cried like a Kardashian that day. I swear <laughs> to God, I cried like a Kardashian that day. I, I believe you. I believe yeah. you. I think I, like still, I still tear up if I think about. It, I think I, I think I can still tear up. He's like that the, game, the biggest Miami Heat fan that I know. I'm a huge, yep. huge D Wade fan, and I love Dirk. And I got to meet Dirk and watch him work out okay. and work out with him when he was in Dallas when I was there for summer league, but. You know, going back to your point, like I didn't know if I was ready, but I wasn't going to let the opportunity exactly. Out, we weren't out, phased out, by. It, it, I wasn't going to let the moment outshine what I thought I could bring to the okay. team. And you know, we played a game, and I threw like a no look behind the back pass on a layup, and Musa lays it up, and I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Where the hell did that come from? <laughs> All right, white chocolate. Well, let's go. <laughs> I was just like, this is. It's wow, a bit, it's a bit out of the ordinary. That's a great comp, white chocolate, <laughs> great comparison. Uh, oh my god! But I, I did my best. I gave it everything. I had two ten days uh, with Brooklyn. I then got a ten day with Wait, Minnesota, Minnesota yeah. yep. and then I got signed to them for the rest of the season and spent all off season with them. And you know, I was meant to get signed there, and it didn't work out. They had other stuff going on, and you know, that was kind of it. Finished up, and you know, now we're we're traveling the world playing. Exactly, and. We are having a lot of fun here. We want to talk about now your two present teams. We all talk about how is your performance at Southeast Melbourne Phoenix and obviously where we saw you no at way, the no, Guaynabo well, Mets. Well, I saw him in the Phoenix well, too. Well, exactly. I'm talking about in person. The oh, first time yeah, we yeah, saw yeah. him in person. I, he's already shining the G-City one. So let's start with the Mets then. <laughs> You're already shining the, 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 the shirt. Here we got your stats for this season. Those are pretty impressive stats right there. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think the best stat was being one and eight, and then finishing like yeah, true, true that twenty and or whatever nineteen and and seven for the remainder. But look, it, it's nice to to see the ball go on the hole. I know as a as a booster or an import over here, there is a lot of earnest on you know being productive and and making an effect. But I think my biggest thing I wanted to bring is like, okay, I'm gonna play relentless every possession, every night. I'm gonna dive on every loose ball. I'm gonna make you feel me every possession. I'm going to hit you. I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to, you know, be nice to you. I'm going to shake your hand. I'm going to make sure I learn people's names. I'm going to make sure the, the fans, everyone's interacted with from both yep. teams, from crowds, everything. So I want to enjoy my experience now. And I think so many players get so focused on, I need to win, you know, stuff you, everyone else, like uh, stuff this crowd, like whatever. Yeah. I just, I look around and I start talking shit. I eat their popcorn. I like pretend to have some of their beer. Yeah. And I... people go, I want to hate him. But, but I, I can't. can't. I He's can't. actually kind of nice. Can, like, yeah. you know, he ate my popcorn. Like, <laughs> people see it. And you, it, like, it's a moment or it's just dapping up the little kid that's on the sideline. Exactly. And he might have a Carolina yeah. or a Mike Wes shirt on, but it doesn't matter. Indios, brother. Like, cool. Yeah, you know, exactly. he's like, I just dapped up a player. They're exactly. the memories I look at this season. I go, that's what it's worth because I want to leave and leave an impression and then hopefully come back for many more seasons. And whether it's with Guanabo and they'd love to keep me, fantastic. If it's not and it's a new home somewhere, then awesome. Build the foundation, start afresh, but give that same love of my life through the game, not my love of the game to the game. It's my life that I want to bring to the actual court and experience for people. Yeah, like I think we went to a lot of Wayne Hour games, you know, uh, this season. And we saw that, those interactions. We saw you talking with kids that were, you know, on the sidelines. We saw you... Uh, talking with people that were sitting on sideline, you know, like Molusco and other personalities here in Puerto Rico that they were just standing there. They talked to you and you were like, yeah, you know, you just turned back around. You were talking to them. Uh, suddenly the ref was like, okay, here, check ball. And you were, oh, 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 shit, right. So, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's keep playing. But I saw that and I, actually I told Gabriel, I was like, I'm impressed because like, Mitch just seems so like such a genuine guy, you know, exactly. like he talks to everybody, like yep. he has uh, uh, laughter for everybody. You know, he's always laughing. He's not like serious, you know, obviously he plays hard. He gives it all on the on the court. But with, you know, with the fans, with the other te- with the other people, you know, uh, the other team, his teammates, he's always like there. He's like you started the season off uh, injured. And you were always in every single game I saw you. You were, you know, clapping, dabbing them up. Like yep. you talked to them, and I was like, man, that, you know, 
that's a great team. That's a great teammate to have, you know, somebody that has your back, even though he might be going to, to his own stuff, you know, probably being injured, you weren't, you know, uh, in a great mental space, but you knew that even on the bench, you could have an, an effect on your team and on the plane. Uh, so like, I, I love that about you. You know, I saw that and I was like, man, look, when I was, a you know, a teenager playing basketball, you know, I was like, if I'm not playing, I'm like, fuck this. You know, like exactly. I was like this, yep. that type of guy. That's yeah. why, I, that's why I didn't reach professionals. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I wasn't any good. And I, and when they didn't let me play, I was like, fuck you. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's why I, that. <laughs> why I didn't make it. But, uh, like when I saw you, I was like, man, that's what, you know, what teammates are made of. That's what real camaraderie is made of. You know, exactly. like you're going to war together in, on the court, you know, and off it, your friends, you know, you can go out with Mike Scott and get a beer and, you know, you were just playing a seven game series against exactly. him, you know, and and I think that's more valuable than anything else, you know, like those relationships that you build and you keep, you know, that's, that's incredible. Exactly. Uh, I think for me, I, I really understand now that, I mean, the power of one is never going to be as strong as the power of many. And as much as we think that we're invincible and we don't need to talk to anyone or share our thoughts or be whatever it is we want to be, when we band together, we're actually a lot stronger and we can actually overcome a lot more. There's a lot more information we can retain. There's yep. a lot more things we can be held accountable for. So there's all these different you know, routes we can take. But when it comes to sport, people just go, it's white line fever. Now, I'm not going to always help you off the floor or anything like that. Exactly. But after the game, you're right. Like You respect the people yeah. because I understand what it's like to have no money and to come from not a lot. Yep. So when everyone comes and watches these games, I know Puerto Rico is probably not as well off as Australia on average. I know the, the minimum wage, yeah. I know the, the homeless rates, I know all those little different things. So it's like, okay, well, these people have worked their ass off all week. They've brought their family and maybe a kid or a cousin or a brother or a partner, whoever, to the game. They've probably got a drink, some food. They probably bought a jersey at some point. They're spending their hard-earned money to come and support us. And they're, they're spending their hard-earned money to come and boo me and throw popcorn at me. So the least I can do is interact with them and exactly. make it a memorable experience. Exactly. And then the players on the other teams, the, the the ownership, the coaches, just saying like, hey, all the best coach you know, for the game when we're walking on court. I always find that if someone walks in a room and says to me, hello, 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 and says it to everyone and comes up to me and says, hey, like, good to see you. I, don't, I may not know who it is, but I'll remember that person. And the next time they do it, I'd be like, they've done it again. And I'm like, hey, man, what's your name? It's like, oh, exactly. it's Tim, you know, where, where have we met? Like, I'm, I'm really sorry. And straight away, that person is going to have a connection with me because I now value the fact they gave me for no reason, for no, you know, yep. future, oh, I hope he talks to me so I can, you know, go skydiving with him, whatever it is. <laughs> it's nothing like that. It's just people being genuine. And I think I enjoy the game so much now and... Numbers are nice, winning's better, you know, but at the same time, just being happy is even far greater exactly. than both of those things. And yeah, you're right. Like I, I commend players that kick my ass and I, I always respect the people where I feel like I had a dominant performance over because, yep. you know, I, I know how much I care about the game and the future generations of doing it the right way, but also enjoying it along the way and enjoying life as well as being a professional athlete. But then I can't forget that some other people have had it harder than me And I can never exactly. compare my story to someone else's and say, well, mine means more because it hurt me more. Yep. Well, I don't really know and it doesn't really fucking matter. It's just I need to respect that you're not okay or you're hurting. And that's hard sometimes for people to go, well, I'm in pain, so your pain isn't as important as mine or that's your journey is not exactly. as valuable as mine. It's actually just as important for me to be able to be receptive and say, okay, let me, let me hear a bit of your story. Let me sit down and, and dissect this a exactly. little bit, where your head's at, where you're at. Do you... And that's where I go, you know what? Now I understand it. And that's been probably the last four years. I've really got it. And I think that's where I've had the biggest impact in my career rather than any performance or, or season. And I think we saw it. I think Luis can agree with this. Last That game seven, we saw you be a lot more vocal with your teammates. We saw a Mitch Creek that was helping each other out. He was giving a lot of pointers, even though if you're on the court you're playing or you were at the bench, we saw you being a lot more vocal because especially that game, It was going to be a tough game. You always, you obviously had Boogie Cousins out. 
Carolina's been playing phenomenal basketball at that time. You got the pressure of the home court advantage. You're trying to give the Mets their first appearance in the finals since like two years back, but there's been a lot of years waiting for that championship. And we saw you being a lot more vocal. I don't mean to like jump into a very hurtful <laughs> memory, but what happened that game and how disappointing it was for you guys to not get the job done and to see Carolina head to the finals. So yeah, it's definitely a fresh wound. So thanks for opening that back up. Um, <laughs> uh, Pouring some uh, salt on it. Yeah, Jesus Christ. Um, I'll buy you a beer someday. Yeah, you come good. back. I'll buy. Sounds good. I need a couple. <laughs> um, now nah, look, I there's moments where you go, they were fucking good, like, and they were good. Like yeah. they were good at home. They made huge plays down the stretch. Uh, in this game. You know, I thought Scott made a lot of great plays. Um, he they did a really good job of getting me off of him a lot, and they had two, three That's screens, true. four yeah. screens of possession to get him the ball in a good area and a little bit of separation. And it was just like he just he couldn't miss. So you have that, and then you start to realize like your weak side's going to have to help an extra step, and then you got drop offs to Condit. You know, Tremont. You know, you try to over rotate and you try and hedge, and then he he makes a layup, and then all of a sudden you've got. You know, the cruisers coming in, just shooting from, you know, three-quarter court. Exactly. Franklin was making big plays. And, and we turn around and we go, game seven isn't where we lost the series. We lost the game. We lost the series in games uh, two, four, and six because we were up every single... That's what yeah. you said. Every single, That's what every you single said. game. The <laughs> first one was the biggest. Like game two, we absolutely shit the bed. Uh, coming out in the third, we're up like 14, ended up going down six about three minutes into the third quarter um you know game game four was much the same we had a double digit lead in the third we ended up losing that and then it's a close game they make some shots we miss a couple ones and we should have probably made a few of those i can remember getting an offensive rebound skipping it to gary on the right side opposite our bench and it's a you know it's a it's a three-point game with 50 something seconds to go he misses that we get another chance again to make another shot we miss it they go down it's it's the game but you go okay well maybe Maybe we lose that one. It's okay. We go home again. But it's not just the game seven, but it is. But then in my head, it's like, well, it's not. It's the missed box outs. It's they're not running back exactly. on defense. Like if details. you go back and watch the film, which I don't know how many people go back and watch film, but, you know, play a game, watch it. How many defensive transition mistakes did we have where they just went layup, layup, two on one, dunk, yes. and one, silly fouls, offensive yep. rebounds. The Those slobby, are the ones that kill you. Yeah, turnovers killed us. We had, yeah. I think, nine turnovers or eight turnovers in a quarter. Like we had games where we had three turnovers, and that's the difference between a championship team and a semifinalist team. And for us, you know, as much as Traymon hit big shots and Yomar was incredible, I thought yep. in, in a couple games when it was really, really mattered. When it mattered, yeah. I thought Franklin was... has been yeah, absolutely He's stellar. The X factor. Yeah, yeah he, he needs thing. to just continue to be super, he does the dirty work. super confident. Like yeah. when you're, and he's a, he's an inconsistent yeah, three-point great, shooter. He's a great guy too. But he's he's actually such a big-time player. Yep. And I think he just needs to mentally go, it doesn't matter if I make or miss. My teammates trust me enough to win or lose the game being me. Exactly. And I'm okay with that as well. Like I don't mind if I go two of 25 because I know law of averages is going to say, Whatever those statistics said over fifty games, like that's where I know that's pretty much fifty fifty. Yep. Like essentially, like that's a fifty fifty spread over twos and threes. So yeah. in basketball, everyone goes, Oh, I'm a thirty percent three point shooter. And I'm like, that's great, I'm a fifty percent. They go, Damn man, where'd you play? Show us your stats. And I said, Well, it either goes in or it fucking doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> that's fifty percent to me, man. Like okay. and that's, that's but true. that's you know, if I miss one. The, chan- the, the law of averages says I have a higher chance of making the next one. Exactly. So then if I miss a second one in a row, well, guess what? My head's starting to get bigger. It's going to go in again. Exactly. Three, four in a row. Holy shit, I better bet the house on this one, boys. <laughs> exactly. You know, buy a lot of ticket, I'm winning. Like that's that's how I feel when I miss shots. And it's I don't never feel tired. I never feel tense. I just enjoy it. Like it's this game's too nice. And the people are, are too important and you have to respect them because you've been in their position. And if you're aware enough of that, winning and losing is great. But just the the fact that you were there and you did it the way you thought it needed to be exactly. done, respectfully, effort-wise, 
intentional wise, like that's the most important thing for me and just being consistent with my habits. And as I said, I either win or I lose and I go home, I sleep on my pillow and my loved ones still love me. You know, my relationship, my relationships are still that. Like, yeah, yeah, it's cool, man. Like, you know, I got my hobbies, I got my loves in my life and and that's the most important thing for me. Exactly. Yeah, like, and like I would have said, like, we had you winning in five games, you know, when we did our... Our predictions. Our predictions, you know, before the, the semifinals. Uh, and before we did the, before the playoff starts, we did another prediction. We had you winning the championship. But when game five ended, you know, we were there uh, in Guaynabo. Uh, and like before we interviewed, I was like, I told the guys, you know, if Guaynabo doesn't win game six, you know, if they don't close out the, the series in the game six, they're coming here and they're going to lose. And, you know, the guys from Sports Talk, shout out to Sports Talk PR uh they're why now fans you know yeah. they're die you know, hard they're mets die fans. hard mets fans and and like they were like no 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 like no don't say that we have home court advantage and we're like 18 and one on the on the home court and i was like no 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 if you lose game six you're losing here because the momentum shift from from carolina from every, you know I went to Carolina. We and sucked I, in game five. We were bad. We yeah, shouldn't have won that game. Yeah. We, and, we, we didn't deserve it at like, all. And we were lucky. You played, yeah, you played bad and you won the game. And I was like, you know, Carolina showing me that they wanted more. And uh, teams that are underrated, they are underdogs and they wanted more. You know, when you put them against a wall and you tell them like, it's either swim or sink or swim. They're gonna swim, and they're gonna swim a lot harder than the other team. And they they swam to a shark and got on the back of the shark, and that shark ate us. Like that's yeah, that's what they did, man. Yeah, like that's they, what they did. They had confidence. They were there for each other, and you tip your hat to them. And it's yeah. hard to accept that, but as a professional athlete, and I think I can perform at a very high level mentally and physically on the court. I can accept it and go, good on you. Yeah, like well done. Exactly. But I'm gonna come back. And you're gonna and come I'm, back stronger than ever. And I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be right there again. And we're gonna, we're gonna go at it. And exactly. I back Let's our go. team all the time. I back who we had, as you said earlier. The boogie in, in injury really hurt us. Yeah, it was. You me. know, yeah. um, and having Suarez come in after so much time out, it was a lot of, it was a lot of pressure. A lot he of performed. Pressure. He performed great. Incredible. Yes. Yeah. Tim, uh, Tim Suarez is an absolute yeah. legend. He's I, a champion I, with the Sydney Kings. So. I, I love him to death. Um, we had a very, very good close relationship uh, this entire time, and um you know boogie coming in was you know a, a blessing in a lot of ways um it hurt tim because obviously he's just sitting yep. here training yeah. and watching and i know he wanted to be out there playing and we had a really good thing before we made a really good thing of it afterwards as well with boogie and and then to see boogie get injured it's it's heartbreaking because you're so close you're at the finish exactly. line you can literally turn the hundred the, the the last bend of the relay race on the fourth runner and you're just like, I just got to stumble to the line and you get an injury and you just, you can't plan for it. Okay. And you sit there and then they go, oh yeah, exactly. we're on boys. And I know they went into that change room and they were gaslighting themselves probably. And they came in and look, a credit to the, the Carolina faithful as well. Like they, they showed up in hordes yep. and they were incredible. Um, you know, you just appreciate greatness and that greatness doesn't just come from the the players and the staff and the the trainers it comes from the fans, the fans yeah. and that that was a it was a really special environment to play in there was moments where i just stood there and was like this shit's cool man yeah. like i don't want this to end yeah the carolina fans yeah. are nah, they're, yeah. they're they're legit they're legit, yeah, they're, legit. they're the calentón come on yeah. For, yeah you know they call him the calentón for a reason like and like george condit you know he like called me he was like so i i was like i was in game 3 right I was like, yeah, you so, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was like, no, game four. No, game, game, four, four, game four, four. I was like, yeah, you have to go now, uh, game five, to Guaynabo. Guaynabo fans are allowed. Carolina fans are allowed. He was like, no, 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 no. Don't compare my fans to to Guaynabo fans. And I was like, yep. Oh, shit. I literally sorry. said that. I, I touched a nerve when I asked that question. And, and I understand it because, you know, you think your fans are the greatest. He thinks his fans are the greatest. Everybody's going to say the same thing, you know. But for real, like, you know, I was in the Galenton and yeah, I, I felt it. Yeah. I felt it it was pumping. Yeah, and that's what you it. like from, from Condit and the rest of their team. You yeah. want to think your guys are the best. Exactly. I want to think my G City crew were the I best. the best, exactly. But at the same time, it's it's head to head and, and they won. And 
you know, they, they get to wear the cap right now and, and yeah. maybe they get to wear the crown at the end of this end of this final series. We'll yeah. see. We'll see about and, that. You know, last year I saw a bunch of of games, you know, from the NBL because when I saw Gary sign with, with Southeast Melbourne, I was like, oh, damn. I, I, I was seeing the league before, you know, not watching the games, but – uh, I was looking at it closely because of Lamelo Ball and Josh Giddy yep. and all the prospects, and I was like, "Oh, they have like that, the Future Stars program. I like that." And so I was paying attention. But when I saw Gary signed, I was like, "Oh, Gary signed." Then I saw that you were in in in, in Southeast Melbourne. I was like, "Wait, so Mitch is over there? Mitch played here in Guaynao. So I was like, "Okay." I want to see that. So I used to wake up, I think it was two or three in the morning because yeah. the games here are like two or three in the morning. And I'm not going to lie here. I did not saw one game completely, <laughs> but I can say I saw he a tried. lot. Of, he tried. Yeah, yeah. I saw a lot of. Saw the tip off in that. First, <laughs> I saw a lot of first halves and second halves. So yeah, it was like in the first half, sometimes I fell asleep. Then I was like, shit, I fell awake. It's the third quarter already. Oh, shit, man. All right, let me finish the game off. Uh, the same was vice versa. I was yep. like, I watched first, second quarter. Suddenly, halftime, I was like, I think I can close my ass a little bit. <sighs> yeah, but I saw a lot of games. You were top three in the in the MVP conversation this year. Uh, you know, how does it feel to to be like one of the top guys? You know, over there in Australia, you were. I think you and Bryce Cotton had the the same uh, points per game average, twenty three point four points per game. Yeah, yeah. So the the cool thing was with with all of that is that that you sit there and you go, all right, like I'm a part of um, an organization in Australia, but the best part of it is like the fans, the faithful people that come and do it like every night, like they were out, they were in droves, you ran camps, you do all these things. But then you go out and you're like, okay, well, I'm just going to play this season. Now, I didn't know how I was going to go or nothing. Um but you sit there and you go, well, um, I'm playing in a team right now. This is cool. And then you have a good game and you're like, oh, I played well. And then you play another one. And then we only played 28 games, so it's not as many here. Um, but then by the end of it, you're like, I've had a very consistent season. Yep. And the, the biggest thing I try and coach like into people's minds is the days between your best and the worst should be so minimal, but no one knows the difference. And if you can have that as a bit of a motto, your consistency of progression will just continue, not be a, a, a Mount Everest mountain, but it's just going to be consistent, man. And that's all I did. I just, every day, it was the same thing. Routine, what do I need? Look after my body very well, yep. eat right, do the right things, look after my mental health, my family, my friends, my relationships, my loved ones, and go and play again. And you do it again and again and again. And then the consistency comes and then they're like, oh, you an, an all-star and then an MVP candidate. And it's great. But you're like, I never envisioned myself to be in that position. And I don't want to be, I never start a season and go, I want to be an MVP because that doesn't mean anything. An MVP can be anyone. I look at all the MVPs in the NBA and all the leagues and I go, well, how many championships have you won? You know, have you gone through the, the hardest, you know, thing to do in a professional league and win a championship? And, you know, that's that's something that I really want to try and get at. The league's so, so tough. Um, the level is so high and so consistent. And they everyone plays with a chip on their shoulder and a physicalness and a toughness and a grit that is Australian basketball. Yeah, and when we go to an international stage, everyone goes, man, Aussies are tough. Like, that's how I want to be. Like, I don't necessarily play Aaron overly Baines. physical, yeah. but I, I get perceived as that. And I think, well, I'm actually not really trying to be a dick if i was trying to be a dick i could but that was me exactly. that was me years ago yeah. but i'm i'm in a place where i'm yeah. like i don't need to be an asshole you know to to, to get across you know who exactly. i am as a player or to be effective so yeah incredible season I, I loved my time in the nbl going back there obviously with southeast melbourne for another year um who knows what the future holds there's been a lot of opportunities kind of open up and you know, I want to come back here as well. So hopefully, we hope finish yeah. back here. Finish we this here. Come back go here. home. Have a great season. Stay very healthy and well in in a lot of different ways of life, and then come back and go and work on my tan on Isla Verde again. <laughs> nice, nice, Mitch. Uh, before we we always end the podcast, we like to. There's a little tradition. Yeah, it's got. a tradition we got. You know, where you ask a couple of light questions. You know, just. You know, just for the, the fun mood. of it. Just yeah. Like speed round. Uh, yeah, like a speed round. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, but, damn, it was like every time we went to Waynao, either one of the guards 
uh, fans. I heard them. I was like, damn, like Mitch. Can I be Mitch it. for one day? <laughs> I was like, Mitch, <laughs> killing it over here with the ladies. <laughs> no, nah, they, they love you over here. Look, I, the the fans have been incredible. I mean, the the biggest thing that I I take from it is I just. You know, you go to a game, you see everyone there, you go to Toblato afterwards sometimes, you have a beer with people. And there's always, there's guys, there's girls, there's kids, there's everyone's around. But as an athlete, I'm at a point in my life where like all the distractions aren't really like what fill my cup. Um, you know, prior to leaving and everything else, like, you know, you meet people and you share relationships with people that you go, that's what I want in life. And Okay. You know, I was very fortunate to, to to be with someone that's been incredible, a supporter of me, um, and everything like that's that for me is where where I'm at in my life, and I love the fact that that people think that because I came in here, I was you know, like I knew it was a long season ahead, and I didn't know how I was going to go. And the funny thing was, like when I actually uh, bleached my hair, it I I say this like quote unquote, but my best mate is a professional boxer, and he has like bleach blonde hair and i said when you go back fight again for the first time in a couple of years i said i'll dye my hair blonde and i'll corner you and he's like yep great and then when i came over here his fight got pushed back a couple of times so i had my hair blonde for like four months <laughs> and then i got here and i was like oh, i said to my partner at the time i was like oh babe i was like do i keep the blonde or do i just like go back and just cut it off and go dark hair she's like no 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 keep it so she was the biggest supporter of it and then i went the first night and obviously, the Puerto Rican baseball team had all exactly. gone there. Oh, no. <laughs> That's true. So I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm Puerto Rican baseball. <laughs> so I was like, I was, uh, I think they call it a burrica. Uh, yeah, yeah, I was, yeah. I was like, yeah, I'm part of the family team, now. Yeah. Team Rubio, Team Rubio. Team Rubio. Rubio. Yeah. You're Boricua now. Yeah, yeah. So it was, uh, you know, she was the one that, that really, really she did that. She pushed you to it. Yeah. yeah. And she's like, nah, it looks good. She like, keep it. it. So. You know, when you've got someone like that in your corner, it's it, it's so it's so wonderful. It's so nice to share and, and to have an experience over here with that as well um, is always pretty awesome. Nice. Are you superstitious? And if it's a yes, with what? Not really, no. Nah. Like, I don't listen to music before games. I don't tie my left or my right. Um, I don't really have anything. I normally, like, oof, like I, if anything, like, I sleep before the game. I mean, everyone does that. But I try and make sure, like, I shut off completely. And that's about it. Like, I want to have, okay. like, a zero distraction before the game. Um, you know, the whole... Uh, I think the only superstition I kind of carry is, like, the no sex on game day. I, think, <laughs> I don't know if it's actually a, a thing, but it's like, okay. you know, maybe you get jelly legs or something. <laughs> I can't dunk it because yeah, yeah, exactly you're going up for a dunk and then like yeah, oh shit yeah. I'm not gonna reach the rim yeah you're on the workbench putting in time cutting wood and yeah it's you just can't jump so I've always stayed away from that but yeah man uh, no I don't listen to crazy music or anything anything okay. silly I don't have a playlist I don't have underwear or anything like that that okay. was one of the other that, that, that was one of the other questions if you had like a playlist for pregame so we'll jump to our sometimes our last question do you have a special pair of kicks like what's the best basketball sneaker you've ever worn to play um i think you've got to stay with the ogs and i think everyone if i said on three we all say our favorite pair of shoes i wonder what we would say we can do that. Yeah, we, we can, can do, do that. It. We can do that. Okay, I'll count to three, yeah. and we'll say our favorite pair of sneakers to okay. hoop in. Okay, one, two, three. Kobe hyper six. dunks. Kobe fours. Damn. I said Kobe six. Kobe I said six. hyper dunks. Hyper dunk lows are really good too, and the hyper dunks Damn. are sick. Yeah, I wore those two shoes the most. It's, I didn't have the Kobe fours or the sixes. Uh, yeah. I had the peasant. LeBron sevens. Doesn't have the Kobe. Fours. No, I had the LeBron sevens. Yeah. My first Kobe's, I think, were like the sevens. Or like the, my first ones. Yeah, I had them back when I was like when I was 16, 17, 18. And then they went out of production for a long time. You yeah. couldn't get them. And then when I actually went to the NBA and I got signed uh, with Long Island, I actually bought a pair of like red, white, and blues off eBay. And I was like, oh, yeah. oh sorry, I think it was StockX. Okay. And I bought them and I was like, yeah. And they're like, yeah, these are authentic. First game, boom, blew them out. I was like, all right. You're like, nah, they weren't authentic. I was like, these are the bloody Cobras of the C, not okay. <laughs> These are the Shandong specials. <laughs> I was uh, I was robbed, man. I was like five hundred bucks US. I was I was angry too. I was I was making like a thousand bucks a week. That was it. Yeah, I, mean, I was like yeah, half my I'll check, spend... half my check <laughs> on shit shoes. No refund policy when I went back. I was like, God damn, oh, what an idiot. Yeah. But uh, yeah, no, nah, they're they're definitely right now. I've got an endorsement with Puma for the last few years, so I actually okay. really enjoy the Pumas. Um, 
yeah, there's, there's a, a bunch of really good shoes. On my Instagram, there's actually a, a yellow pair um, of the, the tricolors and they're a, a, a low cut shoe, but they're actually fluorescent yellow, literally like this right okay. here, this wow. color. But they're actually uh, an Are You OK shoe. So I had them designed and Are You OK is a mental health day in Australia we have and it, it acknowledges people asking the genuine question of Are You OK? And speaking okay. about men's mental health, um, the numbers of suicide are, are vastly higher in men, not to shy away that it does happen in women. Um, but there is a lot of things and a stigma around men speaking about their mental health and well-being okay. and actually asking for health uh, help. So I actually wore those shoes for, for quite a few games. I brought them over here, um, but they were fully blown out in the side and I didn't realize, so I couldn't really wear them. But uh, <laughs> they're probably my favorite shoes. They have the most meaning and I okay. think they've probably got the best reaction from people as well um just by what they mean to me and what they mean to other people as well so yeah man i want a yeah. pair of those kicks yeah they're pretty sweet nice. yeah like and puma now has like lamello j cole shoes so yeah puma's, puma's on the on yeah, the, on the come up game. yeah they're, yeah, on the they're come up, up. With, the, with the shoe game so yeah the casual yeah. shoes are actually their best i yeah. think they have the best I casual have like shoes out of nearly four pairs of puma suede like one's black one's yeah. uh red one's yeah. purple and one's like blue yeah, they, they, they've actually done a really good job and I, I've continued to, to stay with them because I really like their casual shoes. Exactly, I really like yeah. their apparel and their streetwear and um, obviously their basketball shoes are, are pretty damn good as well. So it's always great to get a free pair of kicks and not waste 500 bucks on cheap Kobe's. That is soon. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a story that resonates with me. <laughs> yep. You know, I've bought some, some, we've you all, know, we've some all. fake sneakers thinking they're legit. Suddenly, you know, you put the, the UV light and you're like, oh, shit. Oh, that's, that's not white. That's that's gray. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, ah, oh, okay. Sure. I got, I got, you know, my like, question, pendejo, como decimos los boricua. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, well, but Mitch, you know, thank you so much so for being here with us, for taking off your time, you know, to be here. Uh, this is an incredible interview. Really, we had, you know, an interview planned, but like, you know, you just blew us away with a lot of your answers. So for real, you know, yeah, this, this was really fun. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for being the great human being you are, you know, the kind human being you are, you know, never change and, you know, always keep striving to, to be that role model that you are and be more than an athlete. Exactly. Because, you know, in our eyes, you definitely are more than an athlete. Exactly. And we really enjoyed our time here. We really enjoyed seeing you ball here in Guaynabo. And we hope that you come back next season. And we hope that this is the first of many times you visit us in our studio. A lot of blessings in your way. And we're really grateful for you. I appreciate it, guys. Thanks for having me. And to everyone for the season um, in Puerto Rico and across the world that watched the BSN, just a massive thank you. Um, obviously, to Guaynabo, um, the Mets, the organization, the fans all the fans from across the league it's it's been an incredible experience um you welcomed me and my partner you know here we we had a great time my, my family and friends came over like i've just had such an incredible experience here and and i just i i'm very thankful that i've had this opportunity and as we said i want to try and make this a familiar thing and, and i want to try and make it a bit more consistent by trying to find a way to get my residency <laughs> or something and, and call nice. myself an official puerto rican but uh yeah, just once again, thanks you guys for having me in and I appreciate you making time today. Um, so yeah, hope, I'll hopefully see you guys again soon. That'd be awesome if Mitch were officially yeah, for, for, for real, man. For real, That'd be for real. awesome. Go like your, your socials. Oh, sure thing. We got here, that's my Instagram and Twitter. You can find me there. And also we got to give our last shout out to our studios, Webnedicos. That's the info if you need. If you, you know you can say it in Spanish now, Yeah, right? right? It, it just, <laughs> I turned that mode in English. I can't stop it. Ok, ahora estamos. Regresamos al español borigua. Ahí está la información de Webnético, la casa de, 20, de más de 20 podcasts. Y si te interesa hacer contenido, necesitas ayuda. Oye, mejor estudio, mejor equipado, con mejores profesionales, no existe. Webnético es el estudio para ti. Y Gorillo, recuerden seguir a Sazón Deportivo en todas las redes sociales. En Facebook aparecemos como Sazón Deportivo, con acento en lado de Sazón. En Instagram salimos como Sazón underscore Deportivo. En Twitter como Deportivo Sazón. En TikTok como Sazón Deportivo. Todos juntitos y recuerden, ¿verdad? Suscribirse al canal. Tenemos ahí el número de suscriptores. Suscríbanse al canal, ayuden al canal a crecer. Y si quieren ver más contenido, ¿verdad? Eh, deportivo, denle like, denle subscribe, denle a la campanita. Y como siempre en Sazón Deportivo, le ponemos sabor a tus deportes. Y nos fuimos, Corillo.